I, I will too, so it's fair. All right, so anyway, last week we left off. We were starting to talk, uh, still in the Republic, about the education system for our, for our guardians. Talking about what their, uh, especially their early education would look like. Uh, and this is when, uh, this is when, uh, this is why I tie in the abolition of man, we do, uh, at least the first chapter, because it's primarily about education, and especially about like elementary, early education, that sort of thing. So, I think we can bring these two themes together, but first I want to go back through and look at a couple of particular concepts in the education system as we see it in Plato. So what are our two, sure, what are our two stages of education? What's first and then what's second? <coughs> Remember this In Plato, yeah. So what's that? Music and poetry. Yeah, so the first one is music and poetry. And then what? Physical training. Physical training is uh, gymnastics, uh, training for warfare, all of this. Because they are guardians after all. They're supposed to be guarding the city, but they have to have some training in warfare. So that, that's where the specific training uh, for that comes in. So, most of the rest of the discussion in book two is going to focus on the first part of that, which is music and poetry. And Plato has some very specific things to say, very specific uh, kinds of stories and kinds of music that he wants taught. That he wants taught. And that has somewhat to do with the lesson we can take away from uh, the first chapter of the Abolition of Man, Men Without Chests. So, Essentially, part of what Plato is trying to do is to create a well-balanced youth. Right? Somebody who, uh, a young child is going to grow up to be a virtuous adult, virtuous capable of uh, not only defending the city, but then some of them at least capable of ultimately ruling the city. So that involves a certain kind of stories, a certain kind of music, and, a cert and then going forward a certain kind of, of physical training. So let's go through. Let's go through this and look. What, what kinds of stories are to are to be disallowed? Yeah. Yeah. So the big part is certain kinds of stories about the gods are straight out, especially ones where the gods are lying. The gods are deceitful. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Right. So, and to note here, Plato isn't particularly concerned about whether, whether he's lying, right? Whether our poets are going to, are lying about the gods or not. Um, he does want to say that he doesn't want to depict the gods in a way that they could not be right, imperfect in some way. Otherwise, they wouldn't be divine. Right? We wouldn't call them divine if they were imperfect. So, but he's not particularly concerned about whether this is in fact true, whether the Olympic pantheon is really what the divines are like, or if there are any divinities at all. What he's concerned about is, is telling the right archetypal, arch, archetypical story. So he wants to teach these young students virtue. And how does he do that? Well, by, by telling stories about gods who are perfect, are something to aspire to, rather than talking about uh, gods who, like Zeus, are constantly committing adultery, constantly flying in a rage off to war, like Ares, um, constantly fighting with one another and with mortals, and worse still, losing to mortals. Um, if you remember, there was, a, there was a little bit in the Iliad uh, where Ares is almost fatally wounded by, I think it was Achilles? I think it was Achilles. If anyone remembers it, yeah, it's like nodding, Achilles. Then he goes and he, uh, as as another as a history professor here uh, likes to say, um, he launched himself back to Olympus as if he were from a volcano, sat at Zeus's feet and bitched about it. That's not how we want gods to behave. We don't want gods to be whiny losers. We want the god of war to be the exemplar of military virtue. 
So, what's that look like? Well, first of all, not lying. First of all, uh, secondarily and related, not deceiving mortals or each other. And then also there's this big bit about shape-shifting. Why, why does he spend so much time on shape-shifting? Why can't the gods change shape? There's a few reasons, but yeah. He said um, the gods wouldn't become less than what they already are, so mm -hmm. if they're already perfect, if they shape-shift into anything else, then they'd be less than. Right. So in order for something to change, it has to gain an attribute that it didn't, didn't, that it didn't have before, or it has to lose an attribute that it already has. So if the gods gain an attribute that they didn't have before, if it's a good thing that they gain, then they weren't perfect already. Can't do that. If they lose something they already had, then it, presuming that they are perfect, they have all perfect qualities, losing something makes them worse off. So they can't gain or lose any qualities. If they did, they would have either been imperfect to start with or they would become imperfect and no perfect being would voluntarily choose to become imperfect. So we can't have the gods actually changing shape. We can't have Zeus actually turning into a swan. Because if Zeus does exist, he wouldn't do that. And even if he doesn't exist, this isn't what we should be teaching our kids. And he says if they are true, if these things are actually true, so if the, if the traditional um, Greek mythos uh, if that all is true, well, how does he, what, do we, what does he say we should do with all of that, all of those stories? If it's true that, that Zeus turned into a swan and seduced a mortal woman. Yeah? Other than later in their lives? Maybe, if even. A few people, maybe, should find out about this. Because otherwise, that's, that's, if nothing else, horribly scandalous. And is going to teach awful things. Um, not just to... Uh, to young kids, but even to adults, if they're not very well formed in their early education. And that good formation in their early education kind of brings us to this. Brings us to the abolition of man. Because he talks, well, the primary topic of the first chapter here, um, setting aside the, uh, the, the topic of moral subjectivism, which, is more, which he talks more about in the second chapter, which we'll get to later. The main topic here is early education and the effects it has going forward, both the intended effects and the unintended side effects. So he starts off with this, with this nice little example of the tourists at the waterfall. Oh, and I did it wrong. Now I feel bad. I took the wrong image. This is supposed to be scratched out. Anyway. All right. So. How does this story go, and what's the point? Mm -hmm. These two <coughs> people go to a, the waterfall, and one person says, this, one's a, this is sublime, and that's an okay statement, but the other person said, this is pretty, which is not an okay statement, because they're not describing the waterfall, they're actually describing their feelings towards the waterfall. So yeah, that's what, that's what, um, the Green Book, which is this this like elementary grammar textbook that he well, I guess it'd be more like a high school grammar textbook that he's reviewing. That's what that's how it's how it's describing this, right? So it's describing this in terms of of the two tourists are at the waterfall, and one of them says this is sublime, describing meaning to describe the waterfall, and the other says this is pretty, meaning to describe the waterfall. Uh, Coleridge, an onlooker who is narrating the story in this case, um, says that this one is the correct response to the waterfall, and this one is incorrect. But the authors of the Green Book, this is the one that Lewis is criticizing throughout, what they, what they note is that what the, what the two tourists are, not, are saying is not, this thing, this waterfall, is in fact sublime, or this waterfall is in fact pretty. What they're saying is, I have sublime feelings about the waterfall. Right. What's the difference? Or give me another example. So if I were to say, for instance,
kicking puppies is bad or kicking puppies is wrong. If we're taking my statement to mean something similar to how Gaius and Titius, the authors of this book, how they're taking these statements to mean, what would, that, what would, I, what would I really be saying? Yeah. You feel that kicking puppies is wrong. You don't know objectively if it is wrong or not. Something like that, although it might even be stronger. Right? They would say something like, not just, I feel that kicking puppies is wrong. It would be more like, kicking puppies makes me feel bad. Right? Or, I react negatively to people kicking puppies. I don't want to put this, uh, put this too lightly because it's a very strong, uh, it's a very strong view. Um, and now, note, they don't talk about puppy kicking. They don't talk about any ethical issues whatsoever. They're talking about aesthetic judgments, judgments of, of uh, beauty rather than goodness or ethics. But these are predicates of value, as Lewis describes them. These are statements about, about the value of a thing, be that the... the the beauty of it, the goodness of it, uh, the truth of a proposition even, anything like that. The difference between the two views is that uh, the, the sort of traditional view, how Plato would have it, would have us say is, the waterfall is sublime. That's what it is. Right? That's, that is one of the qualities that it has in addition to, right, so it would have the quality of sublimity in addition to having the quality of being 120 feet tall in exactly the same way. Gaius and Titius criticism would say that the waterfall has certain qualities, such as being 120 feet tall, um, having however so many gallons per minute going over it, etc. What qualities it would not have are qualities of aesthetic value. Those are qualities about the person making the judgment, not about the thing that they're judging. So when this person says the waterfall is sublime, what they're talking about is he's talking about himself rather than talking about the waterfall. Similarly, the person who says that the waterfall is pretty, um, presumably uh, she is saying something about her own mind and her own um, aesthetic sensibility rather than talking about the waterfall itself. So they aren't in disagreement. So this was uh, a little later. He says, it would seem silly for one of them to say, this is pretty, and then Coleridge to, see, to say, no, it's not. That's an inappropriate way to, to label that. Because on their view, it would be something like her saying, uh, I feel sick, and him saying, no, I, I feel fine. Because on this view, they are statements about themselves. So this is a view uh, called emotivism. Uh, which is a species of subjectivism. Uh, and subjectivism can, uh, can cover any range of qualities. It can cover only aesthetic judgments. So it can be limited to things like, uh, we might say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That's a subjectivist or an emotivist statement about beauty. It can apply to, uh, to questions of ethics or right and wrong. We can say that this might be right for such and such people, but wrong for another group of people. It can apply to notions of truth. It can apply to so the truth values of proposition. This, uh, so you might say this is true for somebody, but not true for somebody else. And when I say that, in that case, such and such is true, what I would quote really be saying would be, I agree with that statement, or I hold that opinion in some in some subjective fashion that does not mean that I am asserting it as universally true. By contrast, what Plato would end up having to say, we'll get into this a little later as well, would be that the waterfall has a particular quality, right? It, it has a certain kind and a certain degree of beauty, 
And the one tourist saying this is sublime is simply recognizing that. Just like you would be recognizing that it's 120 feet tall. A further note on this before we move on more into the education part and what influences this has. Um, Lewis sets out something of a middle view. Where's the middle view? It's around here somewhere. What would that be? What is this middle view that Lewis sets out? Because he doesn't quite say that uh, the quality of sublime is simply in the waterfall like its height is. And he doesn't quite say that it's entirely our projected emotions either. He says something different, and if this looks familiar, it's this part. Because <coughs> there's a middle of the road view that Lewis takes. Mm -hmm. um, our assessments of like a waterfall, for example, are like a guiding, like they, we can recognize the nature of it, but it's not like a perfect. Yeah. So partially, yes. So it's not. So we can we can have some court, some sort of congruence with it. We can recognize it in a certain way, but we can't recognize it perfectly because our we can't have the exact same quality in our mind as in the waterfall. Plato will get into this as well, and I think Plato would agree with that. That at least going so far. There's something else as well. This is where he said to, to say a shoe fits is not just talking about shoes, but is also talking about feet. What does he mean there? And what's that have to do with waterfalls? Things have, like, objects, like a waterfall have objective value. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it has an objective value. He, he agrees with uh, folks like Plato in, in that, to that extent and in that way. But further, he would say that that objective value is something that exists in relation to an observer, in a sense. Right? So saying the shoe fits is very different from saying the shoe is size 11 or 9 in that case. Those are different statements, right? The shoe fits and the shoe is size 9. What's the difference between the two statements? Was that a hand? Or? No, okay. Okay, now it was a hand. Just because like, you say that the shoe is a size 9 doesn't mean Right. So the difference here is that to say that the shoe fits is to say something about both the shoe and the foot. So to say that the waterfall is sublime is to say something about the waterfall and the observer. Specifically, it's to say that the waterfall has a particular kind of quality that it is fitting to feel a certain way about it. And that's what it means for it to be sublime. So to put it as straightforwardly as possible, a waterfall being sublime, or when, when the tourist says this is sublime, what they mean is this waterfall has qualities which ought to inspire humility, or ought to inspire veneration is another word you use for roughly the same feeling. So any kind of uh, statement of value is yes, it's objective, it's about the real, it's about the thing. But the fact about the thing is about what it can, uh, it's about the thing in relation to an intelligent observer. So it's, it's completely true that the shoe is size 11. It's also, completely, it's also completely true that the shoe fits for somebody with a size nine foot. This is where he gets the analogy of, uh, you remember this, um, saying that he doesn't enjoy the company of small children, but to call old men venerable and to call young children delightful, something, 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 I'll find it. It's in here. So who likes kids? Anyone like being around kids? Okay, so the rest of you are wrong, um, according to Lewis. And he would also say, not just according to 
him. But he would say, according to the long tradition of, of judgment about communal value and about aesthetic value uh, and about certain things about uh, human intersubjectivity. Uh, where is it? That was before that. I should have marked this. Hmm. Anyway, so he says that, in either case, that the, um, I'm sure I'll find it. I could find it. If anyone finds it, let me know. So he says that to say that young children are delightful, roughly, eh, I don't know, there, no. Anyway, when he says young children are delightful, what he means is that they are, in fact, they have certain qualities about them which the ordinary, well-developed, and properly morally educated person would have a certain reaction to them. And someone who doesn't is analogous to someone who's colorblind. Right? So, red has some meaning to it. In other words, it has some objective meaning to it. It reflects certain wavelengths of light. But that's not necessarily what we mean when we say it's red. If we were talking about that, if we wanted to be that specific about what kind of light it reflects, we'd use scientific terms. That's not what we use. We say it's red. What we mean by that is it has a certain impression on most people, people with the properly developed um, visual faculties. And so, so if you don't recognize it as red, we can say that there is something wrong with how your eyes or your optic nerves or uh, the processes in your brain that, that process visual stimuli work. Right? If they aren't working properly insofar as human vision is concerned. Similarly, we can say that somebody who doesn't recognize a moral principle or doesn't recognize um, a case of aesthetic value, so beauty, sublimity, what have you, we would say that their, their faculties for understanding such things aren't properly developed. Now, especially this being in the context of education, this is clearly uh, much more malleable uh, than something like color blindness, which we, presumably we can't correct through, uh, through education or even through training. Color blindness, we can correct it now with technology, but it's a very different thing and presumably temporarily. I'm not exactly sure how the cool glasses things work. They're amazing, though, if you've ever seen these. Anyway, I always, I always think when I, I have a few friends who are colorblind, and I feel like I should, I should, I should bring them in front of the class and use them as a demonstration, oh. because a couple of them are totally fine with that. I've done it. I almost never do it. Anyway, point B. That moral sentiments or moral evaluations are similar to sight. It's a sense that can be that can be correct or incorrect, and because of this, this comes back to what kind of education we need. Because if it is a particular kind of sense that can be developed in a certain way, correctly or incorrectly, that means that it can be developed properly or improperly, and it, so it should be developed properly. So the question arises, how ought we to do that? Well, Lewis gives part of an answer. Plato gives part of an answer. Other education scholars throughout history have given probably more developed answers. So this is why we have things like, uh, this is why we have things like uh, half of book two of the Republic and then all of three bits of four sum of 10 about what kind of stories we should have and what kind of education should, should the guardians should have. Because the guardians are, for Plato, the most important part of society. They're the organizing factor to society. They're not rulers just yet. We haven't gotten to that point, that point of development. And you remember that for the quiz, by the way. Because at this, even at this point, even once we have guardians for our city, we don't have rulers. There's no rulers to our city. It's just assumed that everyone will, will fulfill their function. 
how that's going to work, we, we wind up developing later. But to point out that our guardians have had this particular kind of education is part of what makes them, uh, <coughs> to use Plato's analogy, like well-bred dogs. This recognition, this, this, this ability to recognize, uh, what was the quote? To recognize, what was it? The well or poorly developed in nature and the good or evil in, in human action, something along those lines. Part of that, or that specifically, is a large part of this educational process and why the guardians are to be educated in the way that they are. Uh, and further, why, uh, why Lewis thinks that this particular breed of education is dangerous. Because <coughs> it prevents that. It prevents that kind of development. So, how does it, going back to this education, how does it do so? How does this model of education prevent students from recognizing appropriate values in things. So let me say that again. I, I kind of just dropped a question. Um, so how does this system of, system of education, the guys and tissues are, are Putting forward with this, this lesson in English, I guess. How does this prevent these students from growing up to know, I put crudely, growing up to know right from wrong? How does this go? How does this go so wrong? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so judgments of goodness, judge, judgments of beauty, judgments of truth, even in some cases, wind up getting dismissed as just feelings. Not because, now the important thing to note is, it's not because that is explicitly taught. It's because it's assumed in what's taught. That's the big lesson to take away here. And that's our, I think, our closest uh, connection to this part of the Republic. It isn't what is being taught. It's what's assumed by what's being taught. You've been trying to say things for a while. Do you know what, you know what I'm talking about there? Uh, okay, so it isn't what's being taught. It's what's being assumed by what's being taught that's causing all these far-reaching consequences. Uh, I want to say before that oh, sure, the reason why uh, the, like, the way students, when they're being taught everything, they're already preset, like, it's like they already have a schedule of what things they're going to learn, and then they've got other things which are, like, the things that we shouldn't know about gods, like their own doings and everything. Yeah, so this is, this comes back to where it says the, the, this bit, the task of the modern educator isn't to cut down jungles or to, in other words, to get rid of uh, sentimentality that's going to lead people astray, but rather to to irrigate deserts, as he says. In other words, to, to produce the right sentiments. <coughs> so to your point, it, the problem here is that in teaching this, what they're teaching is to debunk <coughs> sentiments. Right? They're, they're teaching to show, and also to your point as well, to show that these, uh, these judgments of value are essentially meaningless. Or if not meaningless, then they're purely subjective. They're only about me rather than about the thing I'm talking about. So in doing so, any kind of judgment of value winds up being susceptible to the same criticism, even if that isn't what they intended. <coughs> and they get away with it. Well, Lewis says they get away with the, the reason they're able to do this is because they're dealing with a boy. It was a young kid. 
doesn't know any better. This comes back to what I talked about last week, if you remember me talking about Pixar movies. What's this have to do with that? Why do I spend 10 minutes Thursday talking about Inside Out? Yeah. Because it teaches them that the emotions are what control them, not them acting on their emotions. Right. Now, I'm glad I used Inside Out as an example because you could say that Inside Out is a great example of irrigating the deserts of young children's emotions. But, but, the distinction is, and why I, I think, in my judgment, Inside Out is a, is a somewhat uh, philosophically dangerous movie, um, is because it has the wrong, it has the wrong, it places those emotions in the wrong place in the hierarchy of the person. So we remember, this is, this is uh, very much getting ahead of ourselves in terms of Plato, but we will see this if I can find it. There we go. So this model of the head, the belly, and the chest. Plato has, has the notion that we'll see in four and five, if I remember correctly, um, start seeing them that the human being is divided into three parts, just like the just sitting one doesn't be divided into three parts. And this is where that analogy comes in. This is one of those areas where the analogy is critically important. So we have reason, we have desires. So reason, desires, or appetite. And then we have spirit, or passion, or emotion. And these are very distinct. He treats them as three very separate things, just like uh, the philosopher king or the Council of Guardians, whichever the case may be, then uh, their, their, uh, their soldiers, the people who enforce, and the workers, the producers, people who make things, are separate classes of society. The three parts of the soul are just as much separate, and the three parts of the person are just as much separate. And something like Inside Out says, yes, there are these emotions, and they are important, which is something to take away, right? But at the same time, they place the emotion or the spirit at the top. And the reason is what we might say is purely instrumental. Instrumental is for the purpose or for the use of emotion in order to get uh, some kind of, well, even some kind of internal harmony, which we might say is a good thing. But it's emotions that are leading. And so reason withers, it disappears from the, from the picture. Because like I said, remember, uh, remember when we were talking about it, on the inside scenes of Inside Out, where is Riley, the girl? If they're actually doing anything, or the emotions inside. In incidentally, there's a, there's a fantastic, somebody made a, uh, somebody made a re-edit, uh, I can probably find it, post it somewhere in the discussion thing. Um, somebody made a re-edit of, uh, of Inside Out with just the outside parts. Actually, a really good film. It's only, shockingly, it's like 13 minutes long. Um, which just shows you how much of the story was inside and how much of the focus of the story was on the inside. Um, but it actually shows uh, Riley, the girl, and the girl who is ostensibly the main character, it shows her as a real person. It shows her reactions in a way that makes sense. Uh, that we can make sense of as external observers rather than psycho psychoanalysts or something like that. And given that, it gives some perspective to the film as a whole, both, both to show what's, what goes wrong in the psychology of it and then also to give some perspective as to what's going on with the character. Yeah. And having that in mind can actually help correct some of these errors, uh, some, of these, some of these issues. Anyway, I, I, I digress because I'm. I always get sidetracked talking about talking about movies or anything like that. So, apologies. Okay. So we see why I think, uh, given that, we see why um, the gods can't lie in their stories. Right? Going back to the Republic, we see why they have to agree. 
well, actually, do we? Why? Why do the gods have to agree on things? Why can't the gods conflict with one another? Yeah. Doesn't that kind of go back to like if something is a virtue, like you're not trying to outdo other the people that are like you, like you're a musician or something? Yes, exactly. So the gods are, in that sense, like uh, like either musicians in an orchestra, or they are like uh, like what's the word? Uh, like comrades in arms. They're not fighting with one another because they're all united in purpose. They're all perfect. They're all perfectly just. So they would all be united with one another. So that's part of it. That is to show that. Um, that's to show that the just will always act together for the sake of justice. Now what else? There's something else to it as well. He, he, he hints at this because it has this this aspect of the gods always being united in purpose and never quarreling amongst each other. It has a lesson for the development of the city as well. What is that? <coughs> it's relatively simple and straightforward, really, if you give it, if you give it thought. If I just tell you, you'll be like, you'll, you'll be surprised that this was given. I guarantee you. What do, what do the gods, being the exemplars of perfect behavior, what did them not fighting with one another have to teach us about social organization in our city? That we should fight with one another. Right. Yeah. The city should be united in purpose. Just like we should act towards justice, and that will allow us to cooperate with one another, that also means that the city should act as a whole. It shouldn't act um, just like, uh, so just like, there are some gods fighting on either side of any given conflict in mythology, be it a mortal conflict or a divine conflict. We shouldn't have stories like that because we shouldn't have people from our city fighting on opposite sides of various conflicts. The city should stand united. It's a really simple lesson to take forward, but it's important to note because it's something that these stories are meant to teach not just about abstract ethics, but about applied ethics. So just like this doesn't just teach that um, that sentiments are, are unuseful, but it also teaches that uh, particular evaluations are likely to be sentiments. So it teaches particular things about how to actually live. And for Plato's view, it should teach good things about how to actually live. OK, so we see why, we see why the god shouldn't lie. We see why the god shouldn't deceive. We see why the god shouldn't, uh, shouldn't shape change. I didn't mention this, but we also see why the god shouldn't even pretend to shape change. In other words, they shouldn't be, uh, come in an illusion or a, visions or such, um, for the same reason that they shouldn't lie, um, because they should have no reason to. Um, and further, we see why they should always wind up agreeing with one another. OK. What about heroes? What about true stories of the past? How should we teach those? Because so far, we've been talking about mythology. And these are, as he says, the first stories that we should teach. These are the things that we should teach very young children that give us archetypal lessons about the world, fables, something like that. But what about, how should we teach about the actual past? Real stories. So should we teach them straightforwardly as, as best we can determine how they happened, as straightforward historical narratives like we went through today? Should we teach them entirely as fables in order to teach a lesson, using historical figures to teach a lesson? Funny enough, how Plato writes about Socrates, or how a lot of Roman writers will write about historical figures. Or should we do something else? What do you think? What does he say? Or what do you think? Given this model. Yeah. I mean, typically in our society, 
you know, when like Rosa Parks comes to mind, but we typically only talk about, you know, what she did and how that positively impacted our society as a whole. Right. I think Plato would like that. Right. So Rosa Rosa Parks, we don't we don't necessarily need to talk about right, when, when when Rosa Parks comes to mind and even in most fairly in depth biographies, you can guess what they focus on. It's the civil rights struggle. They don't necessarily focus on, you know, early education or or family life, especially where it isn't relevant. There's probably a part, maybe a chapter on it, but where the focus is is where it had historical significance and what we can take away from it. All of this without distorting, well, I can't say without distorting, but all of this without outright lying. Now it might distort. Abraham Lincoln uh, is a fantastic example of, uh, of someone we can take wonderful lessons away from, but we need to focus on the right things. Uh, let me find it. Hold on. One second. Because this is relevant, I, I promise. see what I'm looking for. No, never mind, I'll do that. All right, so quote. My paramount object in this struggle, the Civil War, is to save the Union. It's not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave to do it, and if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would do that also. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps save the Union. What I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe it would help save the Union. I shall do less whenever I shall believe what I am doing hurts the cause, and I shall do more whenever I believe doing more will help the cause. So we see in that case, his objective. So we can see from, from this, and there's also other, there's also other quotations from this, about this sort of thing as well, that Lincoln fought the Civil War for a particular reason, but we've appropriated that narrative, it, we've appropriated that historical event into a narrow narrative about civil rights. Not without reason. There's very good reason to have, especially, not especially, early on in education, to have Lincoln as a hero of civil rights. And he was. But that wasn't it. That wasn't the whole story. There was more to the story that complicates things, but maybe we should talk about that in another context. Talk about that later. Maybe if we're telling another another story, so to speak, we can tell an, we can tell a uh, an historical narrative about um, about excesses in presidential power. Lincoln's a great negative example of that as well, as well as he is a great positive example of the fight forward for civil rights. But depending on the context, the stories can differ, but that doesn't mean that we that any given story is straightforwardly incorrect. What it means is that the stories about the past serve a particular purpose. And that purpose is, is the same as our stories about the gods, our stories about great heroes. Which actually, I mean, the stories about great heroes are more on the level of Lincoln than they are um, about uh, like Zeus. So, so Plato wants to say the same thing, that we, should, we shouldn't necessarily lie, but first of all, we don't have perfect historical knowledge, so if we need to embellish, okay, as long as it serves the purpose, right? As long as it shows heroes as heroic. And where heroes aren't heroic, and we know they weren't heroic, show them getting it in the end, so to speak. We don't want 
to tell our kids stories about uh, a great hero who did lots of great things, but then did a bunch of terrible things. But that's OK, because he did great things, so he got away with it, right? So Lincoln's, again, the I shouldn't be reporting today. <laughs> Lincoln's a great example, because guess what? He got assassinated. And he didn't get assassinated because he freed slaves. He got assassinated because of the other thing, the imposition of, of presidential power that people didn't like. So you can write a nice narrative from that. You can say, Lincoln did great things. He, uh, he contributed greatly to the struggle for civil rights, freeing the slaves, uniting the Union, all of this. Also, he vastly increased power in the executive. And he got, he got it in the end for that. You can write this narrative pretty easily. And that narrative, now, of course, different parts at age appropriate levels, such and such, yeah, yeah, all that. That narrative is a useful narrative for teaching the kinds of things that Plato wants to teach. Virtue, noble rulership, um, not exploiting people, not, not commanding General Sherman. I'm not a southerner, I just, so I don't have much of a dog in the fight, but you know. <coughs> anyway, so we can see that, that even these stories that are true, we can tell them in certain ways to tell to teach certain lessons. Now, another example of this, which it, it's not true, but it's a great example I think I'd like to go to for this, and it has to do with uh, teaching how to resolve disputes in a way that I think Plato would very much like. And it's a contrast. Uh, who, has watched, who has seen the Lord of the Rings movies? Okay. Who's read the books? Awesome. Thank you. Um, you should. All right, so uh, if you recall uh, in the movies, When the ants are getting ready to get the ants, the tree people, when they're getting ready to go to war, uh, what happens in the movie? Come meeting. Yeah, so they meet. Okay. Then what? What do they do at the meeting? Roughly, roughly speaking, they, they, they're deliberating, but what do they decide? What's their decision? What do they decide to do in the movie? Isengard? No. No? No, they don't. Remember, if you recall from the movie, they they deliberate, then they decide this isn't our fight. Right. So if we remember if we remember this, right, they, they decide we're not gonna fight. And Mary and Pip and the Hobbits are, are sorely disappointed at this. They're upset at the end. It's disaster. So well, then what happens? Treebeard is going to take them home. But what happens? Okay. Nobody saw this last weekend, so I guess I'll go through it. Um, am I the only one who watches this at least once a month? I'm exaggerating. Yearly is enough. Um, that I'm not getting right. Um, so, so the hobbits trick them, is what happens. So Mary and Pippin, the two hobbits, tell, tell Treebeard to take them south by Isengard. That'll be, the, that'll be the best way home, safest way there. Doesn't make any sense, but whatever. So they go, and then Treebeard sees the destruction of this forest that he loves so much. Then, Treebeard gets angry. He's furious about the destruction of this forest, so he calls to the other ants, and they go march to war, and they win. Lots of drama, right? Okay, so what happens in the book? You remember? No, fair enough. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> they meet, just like in the movie. We 
If you can be bit to the second, close to the end of the second movie. Spoiling a little bit, but I mean, <laughs> if you don't know who wins, you should. That, that doesn't actually ruin much. Um, regardless, still watch it. And also still read it, but admittedly that takes a long time, so. Do it over the summer. All right, so they meet, again, they deliberate about what to do about this situation. Then, we decide to go to war. Then, they win. That's it. What's the difference? What's the major difference between these two narratives? decide not to go to war. They're not going to go. And then through trickery, the hobbits trick them into going. They trick them into, into figuring something out that makes them change their minds. Over here, they just decide to go to war because they decide that it's the right thing to do, and then they go do it, and they're successful. The end. Super straightforward. Guess which one Plato would like? Any guesses? Movie version or the book version? The movie version. Movie version. Plato would like the movie version. Why is that? Why because they needed a reason to do it. Okay. Well, they did discuss, right? They had some reasons that they were talking about. And presumably, they had reasons to think that it wasn't their fight, right? So, I would argue that Plato would love this book. Plato would love how the book was written. is because, look at the process. They meet, they deliberate, this is where the drama happens. Here, the drama happens somewhere in here, right? The hobbits trick them, so there's a turn. And the tree beard gets furious, and the spirit takes charge. I mean, weird image of spirit in the tree, whatever. Um, but here, Right, so in the movie version, they decided not to fight. But that turns out to have been the wrong decision. So what does that tell us? It tells us that deliberation can, even among very wise people, can turn out the wrong result. So we know that, that going to war was the right answer, both because that's the plot of the movie and because they wound up winning decisively. So. They would have been wrong if they had just listened to abstract pure reason. Whereas over here, they listen to reason. They decide what to do given all of the facts. They discuss with one another. The drama is here in the discussion. And then they go do it. And then, in other words, they go and do the right thing. This is the kind of story Plato would like. Because the drama for Plato is in the mind. It's in the discussion. It's in, all right, let's deliberate. Let's decide what the right thing to do is. And after that, it's, a pre, it's almost a predetermined conclusion. Once we've decided that this is the right course of action, nothing should change. I mean, particular, uh, particular tactics might change, especially if you're going into war or if you're in a, uh, any kind of like, business relationship or anything. It, no plans arise contact with the enemy, that whole thing. Right? So particular tactics might change. We might, we might change how we're going to do something, but the course of action, the overall goal, is never going to change. Because we've decided, we have, we have, through the light of reason, found the right conclusion. Here, we've, through the light of reason, reason has shown us the wrong answer. Plato does not want to teach that. Plato doesn't want to teach that, all right, we can decide on the right thing to do, 
and then let our emotions take over and take us to the right answer. No, clearly not. He wants to say instead, and by the way, Lewis and Tolkien were very good friends, so there's a connection here as well. Um, instead, we should say, all right, we should use our rational, rational capacity to, to determine what the right answer is, and then do it. And the doing it part, that's, that's just sort of, that's the, the denouement. This is the drama, and this is the climax. Here, this is the drama, this is the drama, and this is the climax. Of course, this doesn't make a great movie. It's a good book, though. Anyway. That's another example here of, of the kind of story and the kind of lesson from that kind of a story that I think Plato would want us to take away and that he would encourage in this education system. Okay. So... I do want to continue this on uh, Thursday, because we're running out of time. Um, I want to continue on Thursday talking about uh, the abolition of man and uh, wrapping up the rest of the education stuff. And also talking a little bit more about, uh, about subjectivism and how that, how that comes into play here. Uh, so part of that is uh, I, I want to go into um, the idea of, of teaching teaching our next generation in this way, in the way that Gaius and Titius presents. And if, that, if the problem that Lewis recognizes in that, uh, namely that it's, it's a kind of propaganda, it's, it's inorganic, unnatural, if that kind of criticism can apply to Plato, because we do have, notice, we have somebody ambiguous saying from the outside what these kids should be learning. And it's not just, you know, people teaching, like people teaching what they know. It's they're teaching from a selected curriculum in, in a very precise way. So I want to take a look and see if, if, if the manner that Plato is proposing, if it falls to the same criticism that Lewis levels, if it defeats the criticism that Lewis levels, so if Lewis says that that's bad, Plato says it's good, and maybe Plato's right. That's possible. Or if it manages to avoid the criticism in a different way. So that will, first of all, we'll look at the specifics of it. And then also that will give you an idea for once we do the final papers, quite a while from now, uh, when we do that, this will give you a good idea of how to maneuver around uh, the objections that an opponent might present. So we'll take a look at that. So uh, with that, I will see you on Thursday. No new reading. Or what am I saying? Wednesday. See you Wednesday. No new reading. Um, but we're going to be going back through uh, chapter one and book two. Okay, see you then.